The title of the sermon is How Satan Rules the World. Now, many people don't even believe in Satan. They have no concept as to who and what Satan is. If anything, they believe it may be some kind of an evil influence, but they don't believe that this is a being, a being created by God who at one time created him as morning star, Lucifer, perfect. But then, of course, sin was found in him. And now he is the most powerful evil force and who is out there to destroy us. You see, Satan is a god, the ruler of this world. He's worshipped by men. Many don't realize that. He is ruling men, and most don't realize that either. Satan rules by deceiving us. He has blinded the minds of the people who follow his desires. Satan is a liar. He is a murderer. From the beginning, Christ says. Why? Well, he deceived Eve. Eve sinned. Adam sinned. Sin is not only the transgression of the law, the wages of sin is death. So he is man's murderer. And of course he lied to Eve. He is also the destroyer. He is the originator of war. There was no war before Satan started the rebellion against God. As I said, people worship him. Israel, ancient Israel, worshipped him and demons. They sacrificed to demons. They thought they were worshipping God, the true God, but they did not. Notice this in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32. Deuteronomy, chapter 32, and I'm going to read for the 16 to 18. And there we read this. Verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they didn't know. To new gods, new arrivals, that your fathers did not fear. Verse 18, of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful. And have forgotten the God who fathered you. But this is not the only passage. It's actually later on quoted by Stephen in the book of Acts. But also let's turn to Psalm 106. And as I said, I believe most Israelites had no idea that they were doing that. Psalm 106, verses 35 to 38. Psalm 106, verse 35. But they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Is it that much different today? Think about it. Are we polluting our lands through all the terrible crimes, the abortions, the wars? Amos chapter 5 gives us another example. Amos chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. And here God is asking the pertinent question. Amos 5 and verse 25, he says, Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years? O house of Israel, it says you also, the word also shouldn't be here, you carried 
Sickes. And the margin points out this was a pagan god. You carried Sickes, your king, and Chion, another pagan god, your idols, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. So they didn't worship God at all. They worshiped demons, not knowing that these were demons, but that's exactly what they did. And Paul is warning the church in Corinth not to do that, because there was a danger that they were also doing it. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 to 22. He's talking about not the Passover, he's talking about something which looked like the Passover. And I think I don't have to go much further to explain what he is referring to here. And he says in verse 20, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you, referring to the church here, the church members, to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord, the wine, and the cup of demons. Something looking similar. And you cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? A strong warning to the church at Corinth at the time. A strong warning to the church of God today. Because the danger, obviously, is still there. We find in prophecy that people, even in the future, will continue to worship demons. They have been doing it all along. And they will not cease from doing it, even in the time of terrible troubles. Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Verses 20 to 21. Terrible things are being described here. What's going to happen to mankind at the time of the sixth trumpet? And in verse 20 we read, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, nor hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. You see, Satan wants to be worshipped. Demons want to be worshipped. Men inadvertently are doing exactly that, having been deceived by Satan to do just that. And of course, Satan rules the world. Now, God gave him the power over man's kingdoms. It doesn't happen without God's consent. God lets him do it up until the time of Christ's return. And so Christ did not dispute the fact that Satan rules the world, rules mankind, rules man's kingdoms during the time of the temptation in the wilderness. Let's notice Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, all of them, without any exception, in a moment of time, and the devil said to him, Jesus Christ, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Strong words. Christ didn't say, no, you cannot give me that because you don't have the authority. Christ knew he had the authority. Christ knew that Satan ruled the world. He rules all the kingdoms of the world. He rules all the governments of the world without exception. Notice John chapter 14. These are Christ's words. John 14, 
and verse 30. John 14 and verse 30. Christ is telling his disciples, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. No, Christ, of course, overcame him. Christ, of course, didn't allow Satan to influence him. But he clearly said, Satan is the ruler of this world. And so, just looking at the Roman Empire, and looking at the ten revivals of the Roman Empire, the last one of which we are experiencing in Europe right now, who gave the Roman Empire and all the rulers and leaders up until now the power? Who raised them up, so to speak? Notice Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13 and verse 4. Here, of course, the Roman Empire is described with its ten revivals. And it says, And so they worshipped the dragon, another symbol for Satan, who gave authority to the beast. The beast talking about the entire empire, its revivals, and of course, the last representative. All of that included, it is Satan who gave the authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? You see, that's what they are seeing. They're seeing a power which is a war-mongering power. It's always been, and it will be again in the future. But the point I want to make is, it is Satan, not God. Now, God allows it. But it is Satan who gave the authority to the Roman Empire, the empires before, and the revivals up until today. We even find that later, it's going to be Satan and his demons who will go out to the whole world to gather all of them, all the people, all the kingdoms, which will still exist at that time, at Armageddon, in order to fight Jesus Christ, we read that in Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 to 16. Revelation 16 and verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan the devil, and out of the mouth of the beast, that's the last representative now, the final leader, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, a religious leader was going to walk and work hand in hand with a beast. Verse 14, for they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. And then Christ is giving this warning in verse 15, behold, I am coming, I am coming as a thief, Blessed is he who watches and keeps the garments, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. And then in verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. See, it's not the place where the battle is going to take place. It's the place where they will be gathered. And then they will move towards Jerusalem to fight against Christ who has returned or will return at that time. Again, the point is, Satan is in control. Demons are in control. They are ruling the world. It's not God. It's not God. It's not God's world. There's this hymn, an old hymn. This is my father's world. And I was told Mr. Armstrong would jump up and down. It's the title of that hymn. Because it's not God's world. Now, I grant you that. Some leaders are more evil than others. That's very clear. Think of Putin. Think of Erdogan. Think of Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea. Think of Xi Jinping, the leader of China. Think of Ali Khamenei, the leader of Iran. And of course, the list may go on. 
Yes, of course, some are worse than others. But the point is, Satan gives his power to whoever he wants, without exception. And I mean without exception. We probably heard that Donald Trump, when he was president, was talking about the fact that he was the anointed one. I've heard him say this. He was looking up to heaven, raising his hands. I am the anointed one. Yeah, but if he is the anointed one, who anointed him? And then also, what about the idea, if God put Trump in office, he also did put Biden in office, and he put Obama in office, and he put Bush in office, and the list is endless. I found this comment by a pastor on the internet. That's what he wrote. Dear friends, God has a plan. The plan is that Joe Biden would be the 46th president of the United States. God put him there. While we never understand God's plan as it unfolds, scripture is clear that God is sovereign over every detail, even the appointment of our new president. But is that true? Is that what the Bible tells you? Or does the Bible tell you something entirely different? What does God say about our nation, the United States of America, today? Notice the book of Hosea, chapter 8. Hosea, chapter 8, and verse 4. He's talking to modern Israel, the modern house of Israel. He says, they set up kings, but not by me. They made princes, and I did not acknowledge it. From the silver and gold, they made idols for themselves, that they might be cut off. Notice also Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit. And where it says here, who devise plans, the NIV and many other translations have here, who are forming an alliance. So they're going out forming alliances with other nations. And God says, yeah, but that doesn't come from me. I didn't inspire them to do that. They voted for presidents and governmental leaders. And he says, yeah, but I didn't inspire them to do that. Now, surely, Satan cannot do anything unless God allows it. And we do read a few scriptures in the book of Daniel to the fact that God is in ultimate control. And that is true. If somebody would otherwise come to power whom God doesn't want to be in that position because it would go against his plan, then yes, God would intervene for sure. But generally speaking, God is not involved. It is Satan who is putting people in certain positions for his ultimate purposes, not knowing, of course, that he is in a sense doing what God allows him to do so that God's plan can be fulfilled. But notice Hosea chapter 13. Hosea 13 and verse 11. Here is one example where God directly got involved. He says, I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. Some say this is referring to Saul. I'm not sure that that is true because God didn't give Saul to the Israelites in his anger. No, it's probably talking about somebody perhaps even at the present time, at our time. We'll have to see how this is going to play out. So sometimes God gets involved, but overall he's not. This is Satan's world. 
And nobody is better than others. Now, I've just explained, and there are some leaders who are worse than others, that's true. But that doesn't mean, oh, then we have, let's say, the righteous United States of America, and you have the evil Germany. I'm saying this for a purpose, because that's what you always hear, especially when you talk about World War II. Now, there cannot be any doubt that Hitler, in my mind, was demonically possessed, I believe, probably even by Satan himself, and that he did terrible, terrible things. There can be no doubt that Germany started World War II. But at the end of the war, you might have heard about this, the city of Dresden was totally destroyed by the Americans in an insane attack, in retaliation. The city was completely leveled. Many other cities were completely leveled. There was no reason for that at all. You see, Satan was behind all this. Because he is behind every war. No war fought by human beings is righteous. Not one. And another satanic lie, another satanic concept with which he rules people, with which he deceives people, is the idea that human wars can ever bring peace. The answer is, they cannot, they will not. And the answer is, no human being is righteous in the eyes of God, who is part of this world. Not one. Not one. Not one leader. Not one who is following the leader. It's a wrong kind of concept. Notice Romans chapter 3. And let's look at this passage again and let's see what the apostle Paul is telling us here. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. And I'm reading all the way up until verse 18. Romans 3 and verse 10. As it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. Unless God opens your mind, you cannot understand. There is none who seeks after God. On your own, you can't. God must see to it that you seek him by opening up your mind. They're all gone out of the way. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongue they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. How true that is today. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now that's a strong indictment. But the world is hopelessly divided. Now, how can this be? How can this be when Satan rules all the kingdoms of this world? How come the world is divided? Well, notice something Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 26. Matthew 12 and verse 26. Now here he was accused of casting out demons through Satan. And he says, if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? In Mark chapter 3 and verse 26, a parallel passage. Notice how that's being rendered. Mark 3 and verse 26. Here Christ is quoted as saying, If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. And then finally in Luke chapter 11, another 
parallel passage, and here I want to take the entire time to read also the context. Luke 11, beginning at verse 14. Luke 11 and verse 14. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. And so it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Another word for Satan, the devil, obviously. The ruler of the demons. And others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to destruction, and a house divided against a house fails and falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stranger, stronger than he comes, or when somebody stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes, him, takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. And he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Of course, he's talking about Christ being stronger than Satan, and he will, as we will see, ultimately make an end to his rule. But he said these words 2,000 years ago. And by that time, Satan was still in charge. He is still in charge today. His kingdom still stands today. So what's Christ talking about here? You see, they accused Christ either of being Satan himself, or working on Satan's behalf, and that through Satan he casts out Satan. That was the accusation. Well, that's what Christ says your accusation is tantamount to. Now, the demons might very well fight against each other for power. There's going to be a few examples I'll bring up. And they might even be self-destructive in destroying those whom they possess or influence. Many examples show you that. But here's the point. They are all united in their rebellion against God and in their desire to kill all of God's people and even all of the Jews. In that way, Satan's kingdom stands for now. They bring persecution on God's people in an attempt to destroy them. They are united in that. We also read that Satan and the demons will bring all the kings together at Armageddon to fight Christ. They are united in that. In Revelation chapter 12, let's quickly look at that. And that is the way how Satan rules. That is the way what he does. Revelation 12 and verse 13. Revelation 12 and verse 13. When the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth... He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Also notice chapter 13, verse 7. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's talking about the beast. Remember the beast which had received power from Satan. And as Satan has authority over all the world, so now this beast is going to have authority given by Satan over all the world persecuting the saints. Let's go back to chapter 2 and verse 10. You might say, well, where's God in all of this? God knows full well what's happening. And he lets sometimes things happen also when it comes to persecution of his saints to strengthen us, to try us, to test us to see out of what metal we are made. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, 
He's talking here to the church in Smyrna. Do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful until death is what Christ is saying. Christ is on the throne, his throne here on earth. God lets him to be here because God wants to see whether we are willing to stand up for God in light of persecution, in light of Satan's temptations. And he also wants to make sure we understand what God's plan is. And God's plan is not that we are today have to go out there to convert the masses. That's what many Christians, in quotes, would tell you. Or oh, that is the only day of salvation today. So we have to go out. We have to convert everyone. Because if we don't convert them, they're going to end up in hell. That's another satanic lie. Another satanic lie. Because you see, this endeavor is doomed it is predestined to failure. It can never happen. It can never work out successfully. Let's think about it a moment. Do you think you could convert Muslims today? Now, ah, I'm not talking about a few exceptions. I'm talking about as a whole. You think you can convert the Hamas terrorists? There is so much deception out there. We heard about it already in the announcements. Oh, they are freedom fighters. No terrorists, freedom fighters. Liberators. I was receiving a memo the other day after my standing watch program in Germany, and somebody said, oh, Hamas, these are good people. They don't kill anyone. They don't kill babies. They don't kill, ch kill children. That's all fake news. Deception galore. Now, Iran was formerly called Persia. And at the time of Daniel, a very powerful demon ruled Persia. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10. And let's read verse 13. Daniel 10 and verse 13. And here, Gabriel is the one who is giving this report to Daniel. He says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia bestood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. And then verse 20. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. Demons, powerful demons. So powerful that Gabriel could not even fight him alone. Michael had to be there to help him. This was a demon over Persia. Then another demon over Greece is described because Persia was you know, replaced then by the kingdom of Greece. Demons are immortal. They can't die. That demon is still in power. He is still ruling Iran today. Think about that. He is still ruling Iran today. So, you're going to go out there and try to convert the masses of Hamas, of Iran. Let's reflect on what Muslims believe. Muslims believe in one God. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. They reject Jesus Christ. They don't believe that God has a son. In other words, they reject the only way to salvation. Because Christ is the only way to salvation. They believe in the prophet Muhammad, but Muhammad is dead. 
can't do anything for them. Tell them that. And you see how much they're going to love you for that. We have a free booklet, Middle Eastern African Nations and Bible Prophecy. I like to read very briefly from pages 62 and 63, because I'm hearing this all the time as well in memos and in other statements. Oh, there is so much in common between the Bible and the Quran. We say in here, so that there is no misunderstanding, Jesus is quite differently described in Muslim thought and the Quran as the Jesus taught in the Holy Scriptures of the Bible. Please note the following comments quoted from the Wikipedia Encyclopedia showing the irreconcilable differences between Muslims and Christians' beliefs pertaining to Jesus Christ. And here it goes. The belief in Jesus is required in Islam and the requirement of being a Muslim. Did you know that? They got to believe in Jesus. The Quran states that Jesus was born to Mary as a result of virginal conception. Jesus was not crucified, but instead he was raised up by God unto the heavens. This raising is understood to mean through bodily ascension. Jesus is considered to have been a Muslim. Islam rejects the view that Jesus was God incarnate or the Son of God, that he was ever crucified or resurrected or that he ever atoned for the sins of mankind. The Quran states that Jesus was created from the act of God's will. The Quran compares this miraculous creation of Jesus with the creation of Adam. Islamic texts categorically deny the idea of crucifixion or death attributed to Jesus by the Bible. There has been unanimous agreement amongst Islamic scholars in denying the crucifixion. Muslims believe that Jesus will return at a time close to the end of the world. Jesus' descent will be in the midst of wars fought by the Mahdi, the Redeemer of Islam against the Antichrist and his followers. Jesus will descend at the point of a white arcade east of Damascus, dressed in yellow robes, his head anointed. He will then join the Mahdi in his war against the Antichrist. Jesus, considered as a Muslim, will abide by the Islamic teachings. Eventually, there will be one community that of Islam. After the death of the Mahdi, Jesus will assume leadership. Jesus' rule is said to be around 40 years after which he will die. Muslims will then bury him in the city Medina in a grave left vacant beside Muhammad. Islamic texts regard Jesus as a righteous messenger of God, reject the idea of him being God or the begotten Son of God. According to Islamic scriptures, the belief that Jesus is God or the Son of God is the sole unpardonable sin. So, you tell the Muslims you're all to totally, completely, utterly wrong here. What you believe is blasphemy, because that's what it is. You wait and see what they're telling you. The concept that you could go out and convert the masses today is absolutely stupid, ridiculous. Now, if it is true that Israel is right now in the process of killing many in Gaza in retaliation to the attack of Hamas on October 7, then that's also very wrong. There's no question that that could be justified. There might be debate as to the figures given, but that there are some, if not many, civilians, children, women, who have been killed now through the quote-unquote retaliation by Israel, there is no doubt about it. That's all wrong. But there's also a demonic twist in that the world now condemns Israel, the villain, and praises Hamas as a victim. And also the Palestinians. There's also this satanic deception that the Palestinians, and I just heard it the other day on CNN, oh, the Palestinians are just, you know, victims of Hamas. They're being ruled by Hamas. They're all totally opposed to Hamas. And they can't do, any, can't do anything about it. Of course, we have an article in the update on that one. But I want to read another one, which was published on October 26 by Israel Today. Despite claims now being made by the majority of Gaza's population, desires peace and is being held captive by Hamas, 
Data and evidence collected over the past two decades consistently demonstrates the opposite. Hamas enjoys widespread support among Gaza's civilian population. And then this article gives all kinds of statistics and concludes the following. All available evidence indicates that approximately 60% of the Gaza Strip's population supports Hamas and its armed struggle against Israel. This support is expressed both in polls and in their active participation in the organization's terrorist acts. So this idea, which is being propagated these days, that Hamas is really not appreciated by the Palestinians and you have to divide and just differentiate between the two, is a satanic lie. See, that's how Satan rules mankind, by spreading lie after lie after lie. We have to understand that today most people do not understand the truth. They cannot understand the truth. That's why it is totally useless to try to convert them. God has not called them yet for salvation. He has not called the masses of the Muslims and the Hindus and all the other religions and most of, quote-unquote, professing Christians to salvation. And that's why they cannot understand the truth. You see, it would be totally useless to try to convert them because they are not going to be converted. They would refuse. Now, God and Christ knew from the beginning that the world would submit to Satan, that the world would sin, that Christ would have to come back to die for mankind because there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And so in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, you find exactly that expressed. Revelation 13 and in verse 8. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. And it's talking about the beast. It's talking about that final leader. That's why it says him and not it. It's going to be a man. It's going to be a man of German, Austrian descent. I think it's German descent. I think the man is alive. He is preparing his coming behind the scenes. He may not know that he is a beast. But the point is this. And all who dwell on the earth ultimately will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The lamb was already slain from the foundation of the world. It was already clear that when the world was created, Jesus Christ would ultimately have to come to die for mankind. Because it is only through Christ's death and our acceptance of his sacrifice that we can obtain forgiveness of sin, that we can obtain reconciliation with God the Father, because our sin has separated us from God the Father. And so we need to be reconciled with God the Father. And that can only happen through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Notice Romans chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. Romans 5 and verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, because Christ is living his life in us. Once we have received the Holy Spirit. And not only that, verse 11, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You could also say the atonement or the at one having become one with God the Father and Jesus Christ. But it is a process. It is a process of becoming one with God, of becoming literal sons and daughters of God the Father. And without Christ's death, we would still be God's enemies. We could never become his friends, his sons, his daughters. We could never understand 
Right? Jesus Christ's death is absolutely necessary for us to obtain salvation. And those who believe, like the Muslims do apparently, that it is an, the unpardonable sin to believe that, they don't understand what they're talking about. Hopelessly deceived by none other than Satan the devil. We are being reconciled with the Father today. Now the world will become reconciled later, after Christ's return. And of course we all celebrated the Day of Atonement. That's past insofar as the celebration is concerned, but it's still future insofar as what it symbolizes. Because the Day of Atonement pictures the event when the world is becoming reconciled with God the Father. When Satan and his demons will be removed from deceiving and ruling mankind. When their rule will have ended. When worshipping Satan and demons will have ended. Now here comes another satanic deception. In fact, several. Several. Because, you see, on the Day of Atonement, in Old Testament times, the book of Leviticus talks about that, there were two goats chosen by lots. And one lot would be called for the Lord, or La Odonai, and the other lot was called for Azazel, or La Azazel. Now, of course, some translations, some Bible translations, when the word Azazel is used, they use the word scapegoat instead, a terribly wrong translation. Thr strike that out of your Bible, if you have it in there, and write Azazel on top of it. it has nothing to do with scapegoat. But you see, the first goat, this La Adonai goat, was offered as a sin offering. The second goat, the Azazel goat, was sent away, alive, in the wilderness. Now, it has been long understood in the past unless Satan's lies came in even when it came to the Church of God. But before those lies came in, it had been long understood that the La Adonai goat pictured Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who gave his life as a sin offering, as a sacrifice for all of mankind. And so the Passover, of course, points to our being selectively called by God at this point, as the first truths, but the Day of Atonement pictures the reconciliation of the entire world. When all of mankind will have the chance to accept Christ's sacrifice, when they finally obtain that knowledge, that understanding. But here is the satanic deception. Because it had long been understood in the church and also by many other commentators that the Azazel goat symbolizes Satan the devil until some very bright intellectual know-it-alls came and said, no, 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 this also refers to Jesus Christ. Absolute satanic blasphemy. The Azazel goat symbolizes Satan, the devil. Before the Azazel goat was sent into the wilderness, the high priest, now symbolic for Jesus Christ, laid both hands upon the head of that goat, confessing over it all the iniquities and transgressions of the Israelites. You see, Satan is responsible for sin. Not for all sin. We could sin without Satan. But he has a lot to do with our sinning against God. You see, Christ died for man's sins. And what man is. And what man has become. And man, upon repentance, receives forgiveness for sins committed by man for which man is responsible. But Christ didn't die for Satan's responsibility. And what Satan is, and what he has become. Christ didn't die so that Satan could obtain forgiveness. The reason is, Satan doesn't want to repent. He has committed the unpardonable sin. Talking about the unpardonable sin, it is Satan who has committed it. Not those who believe that Christ is our only way to salvation. So that part of the sin for which Satan is responsible. That part is being placed right back on his head 
pictured now by the high priest placing his hands on the forehead of the Azazel goat. Now let me just emphasize this. When the high priest places his hands on the Azazel goat and placing the sin Satan is responsible for on Satan's head, this has nothing to do with forgiveness. In placing his hands on the Azazel goat, Christ doesn't forgive Azazel or Satan, nor does he forgive mankind with that gesture. He had already forgiven mankind. That was pictured through the goat which was killed, the goat for the Lord. And then Satan or Azazel is being sent into the wilderness with those sins on its head away from the high priest and the people. And so the Azazel goat was led by a man into the wilderness to see that the goat would not return to the camp of Israel. Now here comes another deception. Subsequently, the Jews changed the procedure. And they also killed the Azazel goat. Whereas the Bible makes it very clear, God commanded very clearly, no, the Azazel goat is not to be killed. Why not? Well, because it pictured Satan, who cannot die. Notice what's going to happen at the beginning of the millennium. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. Revelation 20 and verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is devil, the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. See, in other words, the man takes the goat into the wilderness and sees to it that the goat cannot come back. Satan cannot come back to deceive the nations any longer. And that is how reconciliation between the world and God the Father is going to be accomplished. But you see, Satan knows that. Satan is very angry. And so his wrath is great. Because he knows that his time is short. These events pictured by the Day of Atonement, which we just read about, will happen soon. And he knows that, and he doesn't like it. And so we read in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Now again, he deceives the whole world. He deceives everyone, no exception, except for those whom God calls out of this error. These are the only exceptions. Otherwise, the whole world is deceived. It says, and he was cast to the earth, and his angels, the demons, were cast out with him. And then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have become for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast out and cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. You see, that's important, the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of the testimony. And they didn't love their lives to the death. And therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time left. You can speculate whether what's being described here has already happened. The rebellion, which is of course here described, has already occurred, whether Satan is already thrown down on this earth, whether his time is very short. Your guess is as good as mine, but if you look at the world and its condition, you have to say things are really getting bad. Worse than they've been for a long time. But that doesn't have to refer to you and to me. We can be the exception. We must be the exception. Because Christ has done something for us today which he hasn't done for the world yet, which he will. But he has freed us today already 
from Satan's power. Think about that. And let's read together Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. We don't have to be any longer under the power of Satan. Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. The point is he doesn't have to rule us anymore. We most certainly don't have to worship him or demons, that's for sure. Colossians 1, verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, and he has translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We can already be under the conditions, the requirements of the kingdom of God, which is going to be established here on earth in a few years from now, I would say. We have been set free. We have been delivered from Satan through forgiveness of our sins. Satan has no power over us anymore because through our sins, we were his slaves, but we were delivered from sin and therefore are no longer Satan's slaves. Let's notice Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Hebrews 2 and verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, talking about Christ, likewise shared in the same. In other words, he also became flesh and blood. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Christ released us from the devil and his power because the devil had man enslaved. Man had become captured by the devil. Christ came to release man's captivity by paying the required ransom price, which was his blood. He set us free from Satan. He set us free from sin. We are no longer his slaves, but if we continue sinning, worse yet, if we go back into the world we came out of, we will become, again, those who are under Satan's rule. And unless we repent, Satan will have won. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. Here we're dealing with a situation where somebody did go back into the world, at least temporarily. Paul says, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. In other words, let's not go out to those who left and try to convince them they have to come back and, you know, how wrong they are and all of that. That's not the idea of going after the lost sheep. That's a complete misunderstanding of what the Bible requires. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. Once again. Once again. And Paul is saying we should not become slaves of the devil again. And so we must be aware of Satan's devices. We must be aware of demonic wisdom. We heard about the wrong kind of wisdom before, earlier. Did you know that wisdom which is opposed to God is demonic wisdom? And since the world doesn't have God's wisdom, they are under the rule of Satan the devil, having endorsed his quote-unquote wisdom. James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And here's one way of obtaining that demonic wisdom. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom, in other words, having to have envy, having to have self-seeking, this wisdom does not descend from above, 
but it is earthly, sensual, demonic. So that's where Satan and his demons come in. That's how they influence us to have these kind of ideas. And we are told that even those in the church might fall for Satan and his teachings. Some have, I would say many have in the past, and many more will. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be one of those. You better not. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, or the Living Bible has the last times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now here are people who knew the truth. Here are people who departed from the truth. Listening to doctrines of demons, listening to this demonic wisdom. And then getting to the point where they couldn't be reached anymore because they had seared their conscience with a hot iron. Couldn't be reached anymore. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we find a clear prophecy as to what will happen to some, if not many, in the church. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And look who's behind it. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit, by a demon, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. No, Christ hasn't come yet. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Satan's ultimate goal. He wants to be worshipped. If he can't be worshipped, he can use somebody who can be worshipped, one of his instruments. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness and unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they should be saved. It's not only understanding the truth, it's also loving it and standing up for it and not giving in to compromise. We must never give place to Satan. We must never give an opportunity to Satan to deceive us. It can easily happen. Notice Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. Very clearly a statement, as short as it could be, nor give place to the devil, Paul is telling us. Nor give place to the devil. How can that be? How can it happen? Well, of course, envy, self-seeking is one way. But here's another one in Acts chapter 5, which happened to church members at the time. Acts chapter 5 and verse 3. Because this famous story about Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Apostle saying, okay, we, are, we have sold this place for that much money, and it wasn't true, it was a lie. But in verse 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? See, it was Satan who inspired him to lie because Satan is a liar and the father of lies. And that's what he does. He's sowing the seed and lies. And we must resist Satan. We must sure we don't fall for it. No matter where the lie is and where it comes from. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9.
the admonition from Peter. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's what Satan wants. He wants to devour whomever he can devour. And of course, this is talking about members in the church. He says, verse 9, resist him. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. In other words, we all in the church go through that. We all have to resist Satan. And so no wonder that we read in James chapter 4 and verse 7 the exact same admonition. James 4 and verse 7. It says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So he will not have any power over us anymore once we submit to God and resist him. Saying like Christ said to Satan, go behind me, Satan. I'm not listening to you. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Of course, he spoke to Satan directly. Today, we may be reading stuff on the internet, coming with the same kind of wrong message, rather than saying, get out of this stuff. I don't want to even read it. Oh, it's interesting. You have to read it. Important. But when we resist Satan, when we submit to God, then God will give us the victory over Satan. He will have no power over us. We can say with Christ, he has nothing in me. That's a point we have to come to. And so finally, let's look at this promise by God in Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. Because this scripture tells us that God has made it very clear, Satan doesn't have to rule over us anymore. And we, he will help us to resist Satan. He will help us to get rid of this evil force in our lives. Romans 16 and verse 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.